Revelation chapter 3. All right, make sure as we're going through the book of Revelation, um, you, uh, you read ahead. It'll be in chapter 4, obviously, next time. And um, as, you, as you start to read ahead, you really start to get into the end time stuff, the, the prophetic stuff that, that, the bo- that the book of Revelation speaks to, the things that shall be hereafter. And um, we're going to finish up here. John's writing to the seven churches of Asia, finishing up the things that are. Remember, the divine, the divine outline is given to us in chapter 1 to John, who's in exile on the island of Patmos in his mid-90s, getting the revelation or the unveiling of Jesus Christ, the creator, the son of man, the son of God. And um, he gets a vision of Christ and what Christ is currently doing in the churches how he's ministering to the churches, how he's correcting the churches, how he's blessing the churches. And John's getting this revelation. And Jesus tells him, write the things that you have seen, then write the things that are, then write the things that shall be hereafter. So, as we get into chapter 4 next time, that's the hereafter. Hereafter what? After the church age. We're in the church age right now. And I believe, sadly enough, Again, as we study through the seven churches of Asia, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, these are seven literal churches in the first century, all right? In modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor in that time. Seven literal churches, and they give us a thumbnail sketch also of church history, the history of the church, what the churches look like through the ages, through the centuries, in Christ, within Christianity, within Christendom. And as we come to this last church of Laodicea, we're going to pick it up in verse 14 in a couple moments here. I believe that's the age in which we're in as the church, as a whole. Now again, each individual church, there were many churches at this time, around AD 90, but Christ picks these seven churches, okay, And he tells John to write a letter to these churches. Okay, seven letters actually, but each church out of the seven had a specific letter that went to them, specific letter that went to them. And Jesus picks these churches out because really it speaks to all the churches that are still around today and the problems we all go through. Some churches lose their first love. Some churches are suffering And people are actually losing their lives for Jesus Christ, the church of Smyrna. Some churches have a lot of good brotherly love and have a little strength, and Christ has an open door for them, the church of Philadelphia. Some church, like the church of Laodicea, they're lukewarm. And they're really missing it because they, they let the culture infect the church. But again, through all of these churches, right, that he picks out for us, we need to ask ourselves, how, how is our church? The church that we attend. Are we like the church of Laodicea? Are we like the church of Sardis that has a name that they're great, but they're dead? Are we like the church of Philadelphia that we have a little strength and, and love in Jesus Christ? Are we like the church of Smyrna where we're being persecuted for our faith? Are we like the church of Ephesus that they... Did a lot of good things for Jesus, but they didn't have a passionate love for Jesus. That's what we need to be asking ourselves. And again, within these churches, there's something in history, historical, that we can learn. There's also something practical as as a church corporate that we can learn. And there's something personal for each of our lives that we can pick up and we can learn. Now remember, the usual outline to the churches, as Jesus writes to each church, he says to the seven churches over and over again, I know your works, I know your works, I know your works. I know what's going on in every church. Jesus knows what's going on in every church. Jesus knows what's going on in every heart. The Bible says he walks in the midst of the churches with two and three are gathered in his name. He's, he's there. Now, the divine outline in the midst of the seven churches is what? There's usually a commendation, things that they're doing right. And then there's a criticism, things that they're doing wrong. And then after that, there's a prescription. This is how to get the things that you're doing wrong, how to get them right. And then there's a promise of blessing if the church gets them right. Now again, we're at another church where he just 
goes right to the criticism. There's really no commendation for them. Right to the criticism. Now, again, the church of Laodicea, this church in the first century, okay? It's very interesting. You do a little study. Now, we're moving. As, you, as he writes to the seven churches of Asia, you start at Ephesus, then you start moving north geographically to Pergamos, then you move a little bit more north, and now you're moving south, back down southeast to Laodicea, this last church, which is kind of parallel horizontally with Ephesus. And as he writes to this church, he's going to pick out some things where they're missing it. He's going to really point out some things that he's not involved in. They think he's involved in it, but he's not involved in it. The Lord of the church, the master of the church, the one who died for the church, is outside the church. He's outside the door in this church, and he's knocking. The church before this of Philadelphia, he gives them, and he opens the door from the inside, and he says, I've given you an open door to do ministry. Open door to be blessed and to bless others. This church, he's outside the door, and he's knocking, and he's trying to get in. But the sad part about it is they're lost. And they think that they're on the right path, but they're not. Now, verse 14. It says, unto the angel. Again, who is the angel? It was, angel means messenger. It doesn't always mean an angelic being. It's probably the pastor, the leader of this church. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. And he's going to tell them, write these things. Now again, Laodicea. Okay, it was named for a woman named Laodice, who was Antiochus II's wife. I think around 180 BC. I would have to check that before Jesus, okay? And that's where the city's named. That's when the city's named. And obviously, this, this city, if you do a little background and study for this city, it was a very rich city. It was in between. Colossae, remember, we have an epistle to the Colossians in the New Testament. Paul writes to them. It was in between Colossae and Hierapolis. Laodicea was right in the middle. And as you read the epistles, if you read um, the book of Colossians, Paul says there's some trouble going on, basically, in Laodicea, and he wrote to them. We don't have that book in inspired scripture. But it was a rich city, okay? It was a blessed city. They, They were famous for a few things. They were famous for... They sold this black wool, all right? They had these sheep that reproduced, and they, they had these, this black wool that they would sell these raven black garments, all right? And it made the city very rich. They were famous also for this eye salve, this eye balm that they were able to make and create in the city, and it actually healed infections. People came from all around the neighboring cities to buy their eye salve. They were also famous for their lukewarm water. Very interesting. It was warm water, because in Colossae, the city to the west of them, in Hierapolis, the city to the east of them, right, there was a cold spring in Colossae, right, and there was a hot spring in, Hier- in Hierapolis, and they both built an, an, an aqueduct, if you will, to channel water into Laodicea, and obviously by the time the water got there from the cold spring and the hot spring, it was warm, all right? So Jesus uses... In their minds, okay, what they thought made them rich to explain to them that they were really poor, spiritually speaking. But this is what the city was famous for, the wool, the eye salve, and their lukewarm water. They made big money off the eye salve. They made big money as a city off this black wool that they sold, okay? Now, this city, now listen, it's it's interesting. Because the culture in the city, people were so rich there, okay? The church had thought that it was rich because the culture was rich. The church had thought that they were in need of nothing because the culture was in need of nothing physically, all right, materially. Now, what happened, sadly enough, is the culture infected the church. The church is supposed to affect the culture. But the culture infected the church, And they gave in. And they compromised to to a point, such a point, that they they thought because they were in line with the culture that they were blessed. 
unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, he says, write these things, says the amen. Now, Leo, again, doing a little study means the laity. Obviously, there was something going on in this church of Laodicea where no longer the Lord Jesus Christ was ruling over the church. He wasn't ruling anymore. The people were ruling. It, it, it turned kind of into a democracy kind of thing. That the people were ruling the church. The people they, that thought they knew what spirituality was. And no more were they seeking the Lord as the head of the church. The people were ruling the church. And because of that, they let the culture infect the church. Very interesting. No more was Jesus ruling the church. See, listen, the pastor, the pastors, the elders, the deacons aren't supposed to rule the church. Jesus rules the church and the churches. Those who get to lead in the church are supposed to be the greatest servants, right? This is what the Bible says. But no longer was this going on in this church. The people were ruling in this church. And this is what happened. Write these things, saith the amen. He calls himself the amen. What does amen mean? A amen's not just something you shout out in church. Amen. Amen. And then someone's sitting over there, why, why did you just say amen? What, what, what do you mean by that? It's not, that's, that's okay. You can say amen once in a while. You know what amen means? It means it is true. Truth. That's the truth. And Jesus says, I'm the truth. He goes, I'm writing to you, and I'm about to tell you the truth of what's really going on in your church, in this church. And he also calls himself, write these things, say it the amen, the faithful and true witness. I'm the truth, and I'm writing to you. I'm, I'm having John write to you because I'm the faithful and true witness. I'm the one that's going to speak the truth to you. I'm the, the one that's going to tell the truth to you. Listen, the Bible tells us as Christians to speak the truth in love. All right? You're not doing anybody any good if you're not willing to tell them the truth. But make sure you do it in love. And then he says he calls himself the beginning of the creation of God. Now listen. There's a movement out there, the JWs, they take this verse and they say, well, you know, this means that Jesus is a created being. He's the first creation of God. That's not what it's saying. It means the source, the origin, the reason, okay? Just do a little study. Jesus is the reason for the creation of God. All things were created, what? By him and for him, right? He's what? The source of it all. He's what it's all about. He started it all and it all comes back to him, all right? He's the origin. He's the one who did it. Very simple. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then it says in John chapter 1, right? Nothing was made that wasn't made by him. So if God created everything, and then it tells us in John's gospel that Jesus made everything, then Jesus got to be God. Very simple deduction. Okay? He says, I'm the source. I'm the origin. I'm the reason for creation. And then he says this to them. I know your works. And these are their works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. Now, he takes an illustration from the day. Now, listen, stay with me. He takes an illustration from the day, and the illustration was what? There were aqueducts coming into this city, the city of Laodicea, this rich city from Colossae and from Hierapolis. And Hierapolis, there was a hot spring. Colossae, there was a cold spring. But by the time they got there, the water was warm. And they were famous for their lukewarm water. So Jesus says, let me speak to you about something that you'll understand. You guys have a lot of lukewarm water in your city. And this church was lukewarm. He goes, you're cooling off. You're becoming lukewarm. Okay? And you're cooling off. And he's going to correct them. He tells them this, I would that you were cold or hot. Have a hot spring or have a cold spring. But you guys are so in the middle. See, listen, they thought that they were on fire for God. They thought that they were blessed of God, and Jesus is going to tell them they thought that they were blessed because they were rich. But material blessings don't always translate to the Lord's blessings. 
Sometimes I tell people around here, you know what? You know, you're praying for this and you're praying for that for, for material and physical blessings. I said, that's good. I said, you can ask for those things. But sometimes God's answer is no, because God knows if he gives you those things, you're going to become more cold. I don't want to hear that, Pastor Matt. And then some of you here are just scraping by, just scraping by. But you know what? Jesus knows that because you're just scraping by, you need to keep praying and asking him for some help. God knows everybody's heart here. God knows what's going on. God knows how much we can handle and how much we can't handle. And he tells them this, I know what's going on in this church. I know your works. I know what you're involved in. I know what you're doing. And you're not hot and you're not cold. You're lukewarm. Warm. Now listen, there was something he said that's going on in the church that's destroying the church. Because look what he says. So then because you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I'll throw you up. I'll throw you up. That's what he tells them. Sounds sickening. Because there was something, something sickening going on in the church. There was something that was causing the church to be so infected that it was killing the church and it caused Jesus to be put outside the church. The people were ruling and the people were letting the culture dictate what the church was supposed to look like and be like. And Jesus said, you're basically, you're making me sick. That's what he says. He says, you're making me sick. He goes, sick, I'll spew you, spew you out, of, out of my mouth. I'll throw you up. Like that coffee, when you get your new coffee from Dunkin' Donuts and you get your old coffee in your other cup holder and you grab the, the, the other one by accident that's been there for two days, it's ugh, disgusting. But it's deeper than that. It has to do with you've taken it in and now you gotta, ugh, you got to throw it up. That's what he's saying. He goes, there's a sickness in the church and the only way, he says, that I can fix the sickness is to throw it up out of my mouth. You know what he means by that? Think about that. Vomiting. Why do we vomit? We vomit because we're expelling something that's making us sick or causing us, you know, some pain. That you, your body's not taken to it, right? And we start to gag and we start to vomit to throw it up. Now, it's weird. I hate throwing up. I'm like a little girl. I'm like a baby. I like try to fight it. I start pacing back and forth. I go in the hot water in the tub, and I'm like, oh, Lord, please don't let me throw up. Please don't let me throw up. Oh, Lord, please. And then my daughter, the girl throws up like twice a day. Dad, I ate too much. I got to throw up. All right, go ahead. Oh, I'm good. She's just throwing up all the time. I don't know if that's good or bad, but <laughs> it doesn't bother her that much. I mean, I hate it. I don't like it. But there's something going on in our system that says you're, you're feeling sick. There's something infecting you, and you have to violently expel it and get it out as fast as possible. And that's what he's saying to this church. There's something infecting you in this church that I need to violently expel. Get it out. He's going to tell us what it is. Verse 17. Because you say, I am rich and increase with goods, have need of nothing, and you know not that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What was the problem in the church? <laughs> they, were, they were misrepresenting Jesus to a point that they said, you know what? Because we have material blessing. Because our city is so rich and our church is so rich, then we're spiritual. That's what they said. Sounds like the church in America to me. Listen, don't get mad at me. That's what it sounds like as a whole. Not every church, but as a whole. When you talk to the average Christian, Christian they judge the blessings of God with, you know, how much they have. Really? Well, God's really blessing me because of this and because of that. Because I have this and because I have that. Well, that doesn't always translate to the blessings of God. Sometimes it does. Not all the time. But if you talk to the average Christian, that's what they say. Because I have this. He goes, what? They were professing Christians. They profess. He says, because thou sayest. You keep saying. 
You keep misrepresenting me. You keep saying over and over again, oh, look at our city, look at our culture, look at our church, look at how much we have. We're so blessed. And you keep saying this over and over and over again because you say this. Because you say, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, and I have need of nothing. That's a scary place to be. That's a scary place to be. I have need of nothing. Now, they, from their perspective, they were judging all the blessings of God to the here and now. Right now, this earth. The measly 60, 70, 80, 100 years that we get to live. They judged all the blessings of God in the here and the now. They didn't see anything from the eternal perspective. Nothing. They only saw it from the eyes of the here and the now. I have need of nothing. I'm increased with goods. I have it all. I don't need anything, Lord. And know what? They were good church people, too. They were involved in church. They came out to the church of Laodicea, right? They gathered together, and they would only talk about the here and now. That's scary. Everything was seen through the lenses of right now. Nothing eternal. Caused Jesus to be pushed outside the church. Listen to me. It's not the church's job. You can get mad at me if you want. But it's not the church's job to create self-help groups, okay? Self-help groups to, you know what, how to budget your finances, how to do all this, how to do that, get involved in this group. It's not, that's not our job. Our job is to preach the truth about the kingdom of God, about eternal life, and a byproduct of you going to heaven should cause you to straighten out your life. But it's not the church's job to say, hey, God just wants to straighten out your life in the here and now. God just wants to bless you in the here and now. God just wants to give you everything that your little heart desires so you can be rich. That's wrong. Read about Jesus. How often did he tell people to leave what you have and follow me? The rich young ruler. Lord, what can I do that I can inherit eternal life? Well, keep the commandments. I've done them all, Lord. All right, well, one thing you lack. Sell what you have. Give it to the poor. Come follow me. I, I can't do that, Lord. And he went away sorrowful. He didn't do that with everybody, but many times he did. The culture was infecting the church. Listen, we have a whole nother gospel that's involved in the church today, where if you look at the doctrines of the church, they all line up with biblical historical Christianity. But the fruit of it and what the teachings are is this. God wants to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's what God wants to do. God's a cosmic bellhop. Anytime you need something, you just ring a bell and he'll just give it to you. You know, the blab it and grab it, guys. Well, if you just say it, you can have it. And then they come to church and they say, you know what? I'm sick, but I'm really not sick. Hachu. I'm not sick, Lord. Not you. I'm not sick. But they blab it and grab it. Just because you say it, then God wants to do it for you. Just because you say it, God must want to give it to you. And then if you visualize it, just visualize it. And just speak it into the air, and God will give it to you. And I hear all, I hear all these crazy stories. To me, they're nut jobs, right? God told me to buy, I, I told you the one I heard from, you know, the guy of the pastor of the largest church in America. If you want to call it that, go look it up. Just Google Lodge Church in America and you'll see who I'm talking about. And he visited their house, a family, member, a family in their church, and they couldn't even let him in the house because they opened the door and the couch was like right there. It was like, so they had a, he had to like shimmy over the, between the door and over the couch. And he goes, why do you have this, all this furniture? It doesn't even fit in this room. He goes, because we, we, we named it and claimed it. We got the furniture because we know God's going to give us the house to go with it. Okay, weird, crazy, because they're increased with goods. They think that they're blessed of God. Now listen, don't take me wrong. If God's given you a good job, he's given you a retirement, thank him, bless him. 
But don't think that you are extra spiritual because of it. God knows your heart. God knows what's going on in your life. God sees if you're lukewarm. What about the state that you're in right now with the Lord Jesus Christ? Was there a time in the past where you were on fire for him? Was there a time in the past that you wanted to be involved with him in ministry, in church, in God's people? Or have you cooled? Are you becoming lukewarm? Have you become lukewarm? He says, I counsel you. Look what he says. Look at how gently he says it too. He's upset with them. He's going to throw them up out of their mouth. But look what he does. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. Now what's he talking about? What does he mean? They thought they were rich because of goods, but they were spiritually poor. Okay? He goes, you want to be really rich? Buy from me gold tried in the fire. Now, how do you buy anything from God? Well, you can't earn anything from God. We know that. It's free. But he's saying, your faith should be rich toward me. Read First Peter. talks about this. The trial of your faith is more precious than gold that perishes. Do you have real faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you really know him? Do you really know God? He goes, I counsel you. Because what was wrong with the church? They said, I have need of nothing. And he goes, you know not that you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. Five things. They thought they were the opposite. They thought they had it together and happy and rich and they could see and they were fully clothed. It was the opposite. They were poor. They were naked. They were miserable. Blind. Because I counsel you. This is what you need to do. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. Now listen. In white raiment that you may be clothed. And then he says this. And that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. He says, you're standing in your own righteousness. You're not standing in my righteousness. You remember the, in, in the Old Testament? Remember the, the, the priest and Aaron and the Aaronic priesthood? And God calls the priesthood to wear this certain amount of garb. And then he says, make sure you have garb, this garb, for your undergarments that goes from your midsection area down below your knees. So when the priest walks up the altar that the shame of his nakedness is not seen from the people. Do you know why? You're like, God, what are you talking about? Why, why are you saying that? Do you know why he's saying that? He's saying that because obviously he was ashamed. Like, oh, this guy's backside showing over here. Good, gross, right? Obviously. But more than that, deeper than that, what it meant is this, that if God doesn't clothe you with his righteousness, then you're in your own righteousness and you're naked. You need his righteousness. And this church is now, because they're running around, and they were professors, they were going to church, and they said, God blessing us because we have things. God says, you're standing in your own righteousness. And you don't have any righteousness. What does righteousness mean? It means to be right, in a right standing with God. Right? In a right standing with God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Watch right in the eyes of God. His holiness. His purity. Jesus says, you guys are blind. You guys are naked. You're standing in your own righteousness. You're supposed to be standing in my righteousness. He goes, come. I'm, I'm counseling you. Take the gold and you'll be spiritually rich. My gold. He goes, put on my clothing, my righteousness. I'll clothe you that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. See what he does? He takes something that they would understand from the culture of the day. The city was rich for selling this eye salve. And he says, you guys sell a lot of eye salve so people can see physically, so they can be healed he goes, you need some spiritual sight. You need to see things from the eternal perspective. He goes, come get this from me. Now look what he says here. Verse 19. As many as I love. Isn't this awesome? They were still a church. They were still his church. 
even though he's outside the church. He loved them. He doesn't say he hates them. He doesn't say he wants nothing to do with them. He doesn't say any of that. He says, as many as I love. Now, the love here in the Greek is not agape love, but unconditional love. We know about that kind of love. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about that. And the kind of love that God does have for his people is agape love, which means that it's unconditional. God loves you because God is love. That's the bottom line. But I like this word love here. You know what word it is in the Greek? It's the word phileo, which means he's fond of you. He likes you too. He likes you. Not only God, you love me because you have to love me because you're God and that's just what you do. That's agape love. But he likes you and he's fond of you too. See, that does something for me. That means something to me. That God likes me. That God is fond of me. That God wants a relationship with me. And this is what he's saying here. He goes, I like you. I'm fond of you. And what does he say? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He goes, because I love you, I have to chasten you. Because I love you, I have to put you through some pain. Because I love you, they kind of like, you know, this hurts me more than it hurts you kind of thing. Or it's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt me more than it hurts you. You know what I meant. And that's what he says. He goes, I love you. Now listen, how does he come to correct the church? He comes with, hey, I love you, you know. I love this church. He goes, I love the people in this church. He goes, I love you. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Right? When you look back at your life, and you look back at the things the Lord has done in your life, when you were going through that time of trial, that time of chastening, the thing that really got your attention is, hey, you know what, Jesus? I can't believe that you love me. I can't believe that an all-powerful, created God would come to this earth and die for me to have a relationship with me. And it's your love for me that causes me to want to do the right thing. Not for fear of, oh, I'm going to get it from God if I don't do the right thing. It's your love for me that causes me to want to repent. Look, because that's what he says. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Now look what he says. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Therefore, when you see the word therefore, look back to what's right before it. He goes, because I love you, repent. Because I love you, do the right thing. Because I love you, get it right. Because I love you, ask of me. And I'll give you spiritual sight. Because I love you, ask of me. And I'll cover your wretched nakedness. And I'll make you pure and holy. Because I love you, repent. Right? It's like the way we deal with our kids sometimes. Now, it's okay when they come and they say, Hey, you know what? I better do the right thing because... Uh, and repent and stop doing this because I'm going to get it. That's good. But you know what really means something? When they come and they say, hey, I'm sorry that I hurt you. I'm sorry that I disrespected you because that hurt you. See, that's what God's looking for from this church. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for them to say, hey, you know what, Jesus, I can't believe that you love me. How can I not repent? How can I not stop doing what I'm doing? And look what he says. Verse 20. Behold. When you see the word behold, it means pay attention. This is what he's saying to the church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. There's an invitation here to the church. Now listen. Listen. He says, behold. He goes, the laos, the laity, the people are running the church here. They're covered in their own righteousness. They're not seeking a relationship with me. They're letting the culture infect the church, not the church affect the culture. They're letting all this go on. And he goes, I've been pushed outside the church, and I'm counseling you. He tells it gently in love to what? Just stop that and repent because I love you. And then he says this, I'm outside the church, and I'm knocking. What kind of knock is that? Is it a slam? 
on the outside of the church. Many of you have seen the picture. What's the guy's name? Holman Hunt. Jesus holding the lantern, and he's just knocking outside the door of the church. What kind of knock is that? Is it a bang? Is it a slam? Is it a kick? See, I don't think so. Because when God knocks on the door of your heart, how does he knock? It's a gentle, consistent knock. See, God doesn't lose control. We do. God doesn't lose his mind. We do. And he gently, consistently just knocks. And he says, what does he say about the knock? He says, I'm knocking, but if any man hear my voice. But when you said, I hear a knock, how do I hear your voice? What's he talking about? He's like, the, he's talking to the heartbeat of the church. And he's talking to the heartbeat of the individuals in the church. Now, what is God knocking on your heart today? What's he saying? Because I know when God knocks on the door of my heart, it usually starts like a week, two weeks, six months ago. And it just doesn't stop. And the Holy Spirit just keeps knocking. Gentle, consistent knock. When are you going to get that right? Knock, knock, knock. When are you going to stop doing that? Knock, knock, knock. When are you going to forgive that person? Knock, knock, knock. When are you going to get involved with what I told you to get involved in? That's how he knocks. He doesn't lose control. He doesn't lose his mind. This is his church. He loves this church. And he's knocking gently and consistently. And then what does he say? He goes, if any man will hear my voice, will hear that knock from his voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. What does that mean, sup with him? He goes, I'll dine with him. I'll have fellowship with him again. See, God wants to have fellowship with us. This church broke fellowship. They said, Lord, we got it under control, God. And we got it all under control because we have a lot of goods. So we really don't need you anymore. We got it under control. We're good. We don't need you. We're all right. Jesus pushed outside the church. Gentle knock. Do you want fellowship with me again? Or do you want your goods? Do you want fellowship with me again? Or do you want what you want? And he gently, consistently knocks on the door of our hearts. And it's gentle. Listen, people say this all the time. Pastor Matt, how do I know if it's the devil and I'm just, you know, and, and I'm getting beat up and this and that? How do I know if it's God? It's very, very simple. The devil always comes with condemnation. What does that mean? He comes roaring at the door of your heart and mind, saying, just give up. Stop doing what you're doing. Forget about this Jesus stuff. Forget about the church thing. Forget about the Bible. You can't do it anyway. You're just a loser. Just live life for yourself. You know what? Give up. That's condemnation. But when it's the Holy Spirit's knock through Jesus Christ, it's conviction and it's closeness. And he goes, Stop doing what you're doing and repent because I love you. That's how God does it. Now look at the promise and we'll close. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He says, I have a throne and I've made you to rule and reign with me. If you overcome, you'll rule and you'll reign with me. If you open the door, you'll rule and you'll reign with me. And he, then he says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the, again, plural, churches. The churches. Because God knew that not only was this letter going to be written to this church, but God knew that I was going to be reading and teaching this letter today. And God knew that there'd be churches all down through history that needed to hear the correction of this book. 